Yeah, okay, so welcome everybody to this new uh, seminar series for this uh, academic year or for the Turing Institute on Machine Learning and Dynamical Systems. Oh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Christoph Schuter. We'll be talking about overcoming the time scale problem and learning slow corrective coordinates. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And um, let me say some things in advance. So uh, if there are questions, I would be happy if they are asked immediately in between. And then if you write it into the chat, then we will find a way to do it immediately. And um, um, however I'm interrupted, please do it if you want. Um, let me first go into some of the background in order to explain why I'm interested in this problem and what exactly I mean by collective variables. Um, I will more talk about reaction coordinates. The idea is the following. Uh, we are interested in things like this. This is a new opioid receptor embedded in a membrane. Uh, so this is part of a cell surface. And we are interested in developing uh, pain relief drugs. So we want to understand how small drugs activate this receptor. And then what changes at the orange part inside the cell, and then there are further processes this, that are important in order to understand how a drug can be developed which has less side effects than present drugs. And on the next slide, I have this the process of one of the drugs, fentanyl-like, docking into this receptor. So the membrane is gone. It's now replaced by this gray-shaded area. And you see that the green thing, the drug entering into the receptor. And what more or less is clear is that this uh, process goes along uh, a certain direction. So it goes from outside into the binding pocket of the receptor. And there are many, many problems related to doing such simulations. This is not a simulation which runs in normal time, but it is a snapshot shot of a, a simulation where you can see the process. If you want to do something like this, then the typical problem is that in molecular dynamics, we do time steps on this level of the femtoseconds. And what we do when we want to see the activation of receptors is something which is at least on a second level, which is 15 orders of magnitude more in time. So if you do time steps, it means it is about the order of 10 to 15 or even more time steps. And this is just a process of activation. In order to get statistics, you have to repeat this often enough in order to understand the mechanism of, end, of, of the ligand entering the receptor. So this is really something which goes beyond even the largest computers we have today. And so in, in summary, we can say that it is still infeasible to compute accurate rates or entering rates or transition statistic using conventional MD simulations, just long-term run a big computer. Even with the largest, even with the special purpose computers we have today, Anton and others, it is still impossible to do this. And during the last years, there has been lot of, lots of work, which at the end led to a development of, of procedures which are able to do it to do the simulations about uh, six orders of magnitude faster. And I more or less, I, I want to explain how this is done, at least uh, the, the, the context of it. And then one of the, of the main things that we uh, take a lot of hope in, and this is finding reaction coordinates. In this process of the, the ligand entering the cell, the, 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 the receptor, it should be obvious that there is a lower dimensional structure along which the, the, the ligand goes into the receptor. Uh, if you are lazy, then you would say it is one dimension, just the line connecting the outside to the binding pocket. But obviously, it's more complicated. But still, there is hope that this is low dimensional, at least in comparison to the many, many hundred thousand um, dimensions the system has. So this is a general context in, in biophysics uh, and in many mathematical problems that these kind of complex systems can be understood uh, with 
uh, a comparably low dimension projection to a low dimension, and then many of the of the other degrees of freedom are only important in average or something like this. But there is not a really reliable and general theory for this, and so this is what we um, we will do today. I, I want to explain what we did in this direction finding collecting variables or reaction coordinates for which we can guarantee that they uh, have this, the, the correct long-term behavior that allow to find an effective dynamics of, of the process and which allows allow us to more or less go to much longer time scales than we can by just wrong, uh, running long-term long simulations of these complex objects. And there will be parts, two parts mainly, one is this uh, understanding transitions and introducing the transfer operator and explaining what Markov models are. Many of you will already know, but I have some new things in it. But I need this in order to explain uh, about reaction coordinates and what we can do in this direction. So first, a little bit about transfer operators. And um, my setting is not the general setting that normally is taken because I'm really interested in, in molecular objects, at least for this talk. And then one of the basic models that you can use there is something like this. It's, it's a diffusion in the landscape V. V is like an energy landscape. It's driven by noise. Uh, v has very, very mini, uh, many minima. And uh, X is the state of the full system. This may be hundred thousands of dimensions. The landscape V has multi-scale structures, so there are many deep. Uh, there are few deep worlds, but many, many tiny worlds inside of them. So that at the end, the landscape is like some deep worlds, re relatively rugged, and the main processes are the switches between these deep worlds. On the right hand side, um, uh, this di dynamic is reversible. This is something which is true for molecular dynamics after some simplifications. And then in molecular dynamics, you are always interested in this Boltzmann distribution, which is given there on the right. For this kind of dynamics, this pi is the, um, the um, probability density for which this dynamics is ergodic. And it has a Fokker Planck equation attached to it. We can write it in this rather mathematical form uh, given by this generator L, and L is the generator of the Markov equation. It's a differential equation uh, uh, operator in this case, or by in ge more general cases by the master equation. And then um, it should be L pi here. So this is uh, the relation for the invariant measure. So the Fokker Planck equation does no longer explain single trajectories of the system, it explains the evolution of transition probabilities in state space. So we switched from single trajectories to propagation of functions now. And if we do this, then we have this form of the generator and we can write down an eigenvalue problem for it. And if this is a generator, then this, the, the largest eigenvalue is zero. If the system is reversible, what it is in this case, so it satisfies detailed balance, then this generator is self-adjoint in the correct space. So its spectrum is real valued. All the eigenvalues except zero lie on a negative real line. And uh, so the, I write them as minus lambda j's. And the solution of the Fokker Planck equation shows this the equation which tells us how probability densities are moving, are move, uh, are moved by this system. This is given by the exponential of the generator, and we can plug in the spectral decomposition and write down this transfer operator, the propagator of probability densities. And if you look at this, then you immediately understand if these lambda j, they are all positive reals, the largest one is zero. So there's one component which does not decay with time, the others decay with time. So if we have some dominant time scale, these are lambda j's which are close to zero. So in modulus, the smallest ones, and all the others are far away from, from zero. Uh, okay. So then um, we see that the, the, the eigenvalues of the transfer operator, they are given by this exponential. They, 
the, the ones where the generator has eigenvalues close to zero, the largest ones, or the smallest ones in, in, in modulus, they're, they're, the, uh, the generator has some with for moderate t are close to one, and they obviously are the most important. So if this transfer operator, this is a, a spectral decomposition, for large enough t has some eigenvalues which are dominant, then you can do this decomposition and more or less um, only take the leading eigenvalues, and then all the dominant time scales will be kept. All the eigenvalues which come after this are related to, to processes in your system which are living on shorter time scales. And then you can ask questions. And for example, how good can I represent the system if I just to, uh, take the first D ones, or is, if, there is spectral, if there is a spectral gap or not? All these questions can be answered based on mathematics alone. But in computations, we ask a different question. How can we handle this object? So the transfer operator itself. And there, <coughs> the, the thing what you do, or at least um, in theory do, is you divide your, your state space into subsets. These are the A's here. So you have a finite subdivision of the, of the entire state space of your system. And then what you could do if you would start lot of, lots of short trajectories, you could compute the probability of switches between these sets in time scale tall. So we, we, we fix some time scale, not too long because otherwise it's, it's, it's um, too costly to compute it or even infeasible. And then we could, at least if we do arbitrarily many uh, short trajectories, we co could compute this probability of switching from a i to a j. So these transition probabilities between the boxes or the sets. And this can be written in this Hilbert space as the Galerkin projection of our operator onto the finite dimensional space, which is spanned by the characteristic functions of our sets. So by the formula, you see this immediately. And the scalar product is weighted with the invariant measure. And the T is again the transfer operator that we just discussed. So this means if you compute transition probabilities between sets and your sets are a subdivision of state space, then more or less what you get is a discretization matrix of the transfer operator, which comes out of Galerkin projection of transfer operator onto a finite dimensional space. And in many of these Markov models, these kinds of transition matrices are computed for sets that are chosen very wisely. So that more or less they cover the important dynamics of the system. And now I, I'm going to explain how far this is developed. But in mathematical terms, what we do is we, we have a Galerkin projection or Hilbert space onto a finite dimensional space using the scalar product, and we project our operator onto the space. That's the numerical perspective of what we are doing here. And the next step then is um, that uh, you can do a lot of theory for this and around this, still based on, on this idea that you have boxes. And then you can ask if, if, you're, if you have an arbitrary box discretization, can you understand how well the longest time scales of your transition matrix reproduce the longest time scales of your transfer operator? And the longest time scales of the transfer operator are the time scales you're interested in because these are the longest relaxation effects in your molecular system. And this uh, formula tells you that there are three parts of the, of the error. One is the discretization error. So it depends on the sets you have chosen. And there you can show that if you choose the sets according to the wells in the potential, so a clever choice, which can be done just based on computations, then you can make this, this discretization error very small. The red part is the statistical error. Obviously, you want to compute uh, transition probabilities between boxes. 
And there is a statistical error coming from the fact that you use only finitely many trajectories to compute the transition probabilities. And then there is a Monte Carlo error entering, which is a statistical error, which you have to take into account also. And there is an incompleteness error, which simply comes from the fact that uh, if, you, if your boxes are too large, you may have some transition rates that are left out because you simply uh, didn't decompose your set decomposition uh, good enough. And this is so that there is an upper bound given in mathematical terms that helps you to estimate the error. And then you can choose the sets and the statistics, so the number of trajectories and everything else, so that at the end, you have an estimator giving you the error in the longest time scales. So there is a machinery which has been built and which is now encoded in, in several large codes which are uh, associated with MD packages where you can build these Markov models. And again, the Markov models are the idea that at the end, you just have to compute such a transition matrix between the right sets. And this encodes the longest time scales of your system. And from computing the eigenvalues of this thing, you get approximation of the longest time scales of the system. So this more or less works. And I don't want to go into details about this now because I want to talk about reaction coordinates. But what we should keep in mind, and that's the essential information, is <clears throat> that the longest time scales of the system that we are interested in are encoded in the largest eigenvalues of the transfer operator one that are close to one for a certain time scale. And then if you make the time scale, <coughs> this is this <coughs> equation here. If you make your time scale T large enough, then all the others more or less are already decayed and only the important ones remain. And this time scale, that, that's the time scale I'm interested in. So the time scale on which only the main processes remain and all the small fluctuations and shifts in probability space are gone. I'm no longer interested in this. I'm only interested in the relaxation effect of the system tr making transition between the deep wells and the energy landscape. This is what I want. And this is what we will use later again. And the theory at the end tells us that if we reproduce the eigenvalues good enough, then we also reproduce the time scales good enough. That's the basic mathematical statement. And again, there is a lot of theory which gives us control over this. And you see that it is already 10 years and more old. So since then, many things have developed. <clears throat> and the general idea of Markov models, as I just explained it was, <clears throat> that we do a Galerkin projection on a space spent by characteristic functions of sets. But there are more clever ideas of doing it. For example, we can do ansatz functions, spaces, which are spent by functions that are much better suited in order to explain uh, the shifts between probabilities. They can be problem adaptive. These are these V one to Vn here. And then the same process goes into the direction of something like extended dynamic mode decomposition or variational techniques coming from transfer operators. And there is an <clears throat> entire family of systems studied by many people. I see Yannis here. He was also one of the pioneers in this. And, and the main thing is, the main idea is, that these things only are different in the choice of the ansatz function space that you have at the end. But what they have in common is still that they use linear decomposition. So they, they use linear ansatzes. And what we have now available at the moment is in deep learning, our ansatz functions uh, allow us to do ansatz spaces, which are no longer simple linear combinations of ansatz functions. And it's no longer a simple Galekian projection idea of discretizing the transfer operator and getting the most important eigenvalues. You can now do nonlinear ansatz functions using this neural net uh, functions. And then this is nothing else like a high dimensional nonlinear parameter optimization problem, because now you have not only the parameters in front of the eigenfunctions, but also the eigenfunctions depend on parameters. 
And there are already the first approaches to use the same ideas for this kind of structures in, in combination with deep neural networks or deep learning algorithms, like RAMPnets or ESOCAM. They are working very nicely, but they are still oriented in computing something like the main eigenvectors, the main subspaces in which the main dynamics happens. But what we want to do today and in general is we want to find a way to compute reaction coordinates and make the system much, much smaller in dimension so that all these things can be handled in a lower dimensional space in some sense. And then the effective dynamics can be much better understood because we can write it in terms of direction coordinates and no longer in terms of transition matrix or discretization of transfer operators. <clears throat> so that's the one that the, uh, the logic I want to use or the way I want to go in the next um, slides. And at the end, it's obvious that I want also I also want to use deep learning algorithms because we have seen that these algorithms are scaling very nicely in high dimensions, in very high dimensions, and perhaps even do not suffer from the curse of dimensionality. And this is something obviously needed in, if you want to deal with systems which have hundreds, thousands, or even millions of degrees of freedom. So the next step is talking about what reaction coordinates are and how we can frame them in, in a mathematical sense, in a theoretical sense. I think there's a yeah. question. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Igor, did you want to ask your question? Or? He said, the, well, how is the overdamped uh, setting crucial? Ah, OK. So what I told you is the overdamped setting is a case in which dynamics is reversible and the spectrum is real valued. So this is uh, particularly easy for writing down the spectral decomposition. And I will stay with this in this talk. If you go into the literature, you will find that, uh, for example, the, the Langevin equation, the non-overdamped description of this, that you can do the same stuff also for this, but it's a little bit more involved because on one hand, perhaps you have to deal with complex decompositions, complex values decompositions, or you have to write down a more extended form of the detailed balance condition, which is available. And, uh, but this goes into a completely di different direction. So what I can say is from mathematical terms, reversibility or the, the special form of dynamics I have chosen, makes things much easier to write it down, but it is not essential, at least not for most parts of these algorithms. But if you have it, then we can talk about eigenvalues, and this makes many things easier to explain, and I will stick to it in the following. Yeah, okay, another question by Mert. Do you want to ask directly? Yeah. Yeah. Uh uh, hi, uh, I just wanted to learn how the futures are formulated in the deep learning problem, because as from my, what I understand, you have a different de decompositions and different number of eigenvalues for simulation, right? Right. So if you go into and do these, these papers, then they, they use different directions. One direction is, uh, first of all, in order to uh, go into deep learning, uh, what you need is to write everything as a variational problem. And then there are ways to write down this decomposition, the eigenvalue problem, in fact, as a kind of variational problem in the sense of Rayleigh right, Ritz or something like this. And uh, then you plug this into the, the answer spaces given by deep learning and try to find the right parameters. And obviously, there are side constraints because you have orthogonality between the eigenvalues. And then it's, it gets complicated, but it can be done. Okay. In the ESOCAN process, they use a completely different direction. What they use is they wrote down a new uh, form of partial differential equation based on the Fokker-Planck equation for exit times. So the Fokker-Planck equation is telling you evolution of all probability distributions, but you can write down a similar thing as a boundary value problem uh, for, of starting somewhere and going into a certain set. And this kind of PDEs can then be solved by techniques that have been developed for Fokker-Planck equation-like st structures by neural networks. So this is the structure they use. I okay. See. 
yeah. but they both are working in the full dimension of the space. And this is more or less what I want to get rid in some sense by in the following. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. So first of all, the, the, main, the main idea of what we call the transition manifold, or what is called the transition manifold. So what is the reaction coordinate? So you have this very simple picture here, which is just a two-dimensional representation of something which has the deep. So you see the, the black ones are the contour lines of the energy wells. You see something, a well here. You see an energy well here, and then one here. And a green line is something which connects it and where the someone from physics would tell you this is the path along which the transitions happens with the highest probability. So transitions between the wells if you start the system. A real trajectory would look like something like it wiggles around here for long periods of time. And then it crosses the saddle and goes here, wiggles around there for a long time and then goes here or goes back there or whatever. But in effect, on average, <coughs> the, the, the transitions, this is what the physics people believe, go along the, the green line. And they would call this uh, something like a, a minimal energy path or whatever. But if you go to, to a system with stochastic perturbations, then minimal energy is not the only thing which can make you happy. A reaction coordinate is something which more or less parametrizes propagation along this the green one. The green one is something which we co would call a representation of the transition manifold. But I will go into this in more details later. <clears throat> and what would the reaction coordinate, why would it be, let n be this very high dimension of the system, and m is a very small number. In this case, just one dimensional. The reaction coordinate has the following property. It changes along the green line, but there are contour lines, uh, isosurfaces of the, of the reaction coordinates, and the reaction coordinates is constant along these lines, telling you that along these isosurfaces, which I will call sigma in the following, that along these isosurfaces, more or less the system, and that's the general idea, is quickly equilibrating, <laughs> on the isosurfaces, and it's very slowly equi equilibrating or making transitions along a transition manifold. And more or less reaction coordinate is, some, is, is a map which gives you a parameterization of the, of the reaction coordinate or comes from a parameterization of the reaction coordinate and would more or less tell you about progress along the really important part of the dynamics, while along the red line, along the isosurfaces, the dynamics is not necessarily fast or faster, but it's much faster in equilibration in the sense of it goes quickly. And if you want to have an illustration for this, I don't know what happens there. Sorry. Um, what you see here is if we start from these points, so the, the P is the transition probability. Let's take this red one here. The red one is transition probability of starting in this point here and then waiting for time tau. Since the system is stochastic, it means if I do this, let's say for a few, for a couple of times, then I end up in, let's say, these red dots. Normally, the system wants to go, if it is constrained to this red line, it wants to go into the, the, the minimum. And also, if it is free, it would normally go downhill and close to the minimum on a time scale which is not very short but it's also not so long that it would go from this minimum into this minimum for example but it has a certain equilibration time where it more or less will find as uh, will quickly e equilibrate to something like this if i would start in the in the in the yellow point here i would end up here after this period of time and in the blue point here. And if I would start in another point, the, the, the white point here on the red line, then I would go also somewhere here and the, the distribution of these points would be very similar to the red distribution of points. So points on the same red line would lead to the same kind of probability distribution after some time. That's the general idea. 
Yes. Can I really... ask a question? Sure. Are you talking about the difference between global or local minimum? I'm talking about a system which has some deep minima, some deep minima. And in this, global. Minimum, this sorry? deep is a global. The deep is a global minimum. If there are several ones, it's a global characterization that there are several ones. Okay. Locally, it may have many tiny ones, but globally, it just have three important main wells. Maybe, Christoph, it makes sense to think of this as the Grand Canyon. There is many directions which you go down fast, and then at the bottom, you have some undulations. Exactly. And these, uh, but these undulations can also be um, in op opposite to the Grand Canyon, can be separated by enormous wells, yeah, uh, sure. enormous barriers. So there is something like the Grand Canyon, and if you go from the outside, you go into it, but with even within the canyon, there are enormous barriers separating wells from other wells. That's the general structure of these systems. But for these probability densities, it means that <clears throat> if you have the right kind of reaction coordinates, that if you start on the ISO, surface of a reaction coordinate some of some starting points, then what they end up are very similar transition probabilities. And this means that more or less you can average out along ISO surfaces. So you can project your dynamics along this reaction coordinate psi. You can project it by using equilibration or averaging according to the invariant measure along the ISO the surfaces of the of the reaction coordinate. But this is only true for a good reaction coordinate. So what happens or how can we characterize this? So the general idea is if there is a transition manifold in the system, then in some sense, if I start somewhere, um, then, then I, I should go to a transition probability after some time that are comparable to each other. And this means I, I, I look for a transition manifold, not as a structure in the space of my system. I look it, to it as a structure in the function space behind it, because I'm transporting functions, many points at once, not just one point. I do not follow trajectories. I follow many trajectories. And this means that we have to find transition manifolds as parts of the, of the function spaces. And this Q here tells you that if you start in a certain point X and computes its, its transition probability, then you want to project it onto a point on the transition manifold, the closest point. So there is a, a minimization procedure giving you the F, which is really living on the manifold. And then a uh, parameterization of the transition manifolds from function spaces to the real space gives you direction coordinates. That's more or less the, the thing, how they are connected. So in this theory, transition manifolds are manifolds in function spaces and they map back or are embedded low dimensional manifolds and their parameterization gives direction coordinates. This sounds a little complicated, but has a main, this, uh, a main advantage, and this is given here. If such a transition manifold exists, <clears throat> and we will later see that they exist for many of the systems, if they exist in, in this sense here, so the, that the, uh, if you start and wait for a long enough time, so tau has to be long enough, not too small, not too long, so that what, hap what I explained happens, and compares to the to the projection to the manifold, then there is just a certain error involved. And then our projected transfer operator, using only direction coordinates, gives this lambda heads. The full system gives the lambdas, and the error between the dominant ones is very small. And the dimension of what which, where, which this happened <coughs> is the dominant eigenvalues. So the first D ones as written here. In effect, this means the following. 
uh, if we have such a transition manifold and can find the erection kernel that belongs to us, then we can project our transfer operator in the sense here, going from the real one again to a very low dimensional copy. But this one is still living in a continuous space, but just on the on the transition manifold along the direction coordinates, but in the dimension of direction coordinates, not in the full dimension. And this one will have eigenvalues which are guaranteed be close to the ones that you're interested in. So <clears throat> if such reaction coordinates exist, and we can compute them, then we will be able to project our system to a small dimension, but still the dynamics given by it, the longest time scales by the system, given by the system are still the same than the ones before, the ones that we want to identify. But on the other hand, we see that this procedure gives us something in function space and looks ugly. And it looks like something that, which makes computations difficult. Therefore, I will later replace it by another construction. This is just a theoretical background that we need in order to understand this. Our first step was <clears throat> to have a kernel-based algorithm. So this is a transfer operator, is an operator which has a kernel, a transition kernel, and moves functions. So a kernel-based algorithm is a nice idea. And here is the result of, of one of these papers where we used it in order to discretize the transition operator context and compute um, reaction coordinates by uh, computing kernel approximations of the, of the transfer operator. But this gives you the reaction coordinate, not as a function or something like this, it gives you in, in some test points, n, n test points that you beforehand have to distribute wisely according to the invariant measure. This is difficult enough. But if you are able to do it, then you can use this relatively simple computation here. It's not the most complete, uh, complete, uh, complicated formula, formula of all in order to really compute transition manifolds of <coughs> biomolecules. Here, for example, for, for a protein. <coughs> and you see many of the points coming from a long trajectory. And in this case, the transition manifold three-dimensional tells you how you come from unfolded along the transition manifold into the folded structure. And the structures that you find in these pictures always is you start somewhere, the unfolded structure, and then the collar gives you the progress along the reaction coordinate. And at the end, by the progress, you, you, you end up in the folded structures of the system. And in many cases, you can even show that these kinds of reaction coordinates are very nicely correlated to what physicists believe are reaction co coordinates for the system. So the theory gives back something which people have observed with many calculations and many insights into the system beforehand. What they couldn't do up to now are more complicated systems. For example, here, the aggregation of a peptide into um, an amylite uh, structure. So it's peptide aggregation. Many peptides more or less um, collect to each other and then form fibrils or something like this, which are dangerous objects, for example, in the human brain. They cause many diseases. So, and it's still not completely understood uh, how this is happening and what are the degrees of, what is the mechanism which causes this? And we did it for one of the smaller uh, peptides, which aggregate this NF gale protein, which is uh, a part of, of one of the important proteins, which are important for Alzheimer and other diseases. And we try to understand <coughs> how, what is a good reaction coordinate for the process. If there are already, if there is already a stack of peptides, how do the next, how does the next one enter? And then you can uh, find in this paper, uh, in, in uh, the physics journal given here, you can find how the process works. So how it starts, there are two main mechanisms, how the peptide comes into the, to, 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 to the stack and then after some steps end up uh, as part of the, of the fibril formation process. And again, the reaction coordinates and the process, the demand is the progress along the reaction path. So these pro these, the theory already allows to compute something like this, but it is still suffering from 
high dimensions, and you still need many, many trajectories, short trajectories, to compute the information you need in order to do this kernel decomposition. So we wanted to get something which is easier in theory and allows to do a computation which uh, goes into the direction of deep learning in order to get this nice scaling behavior of these processes. And that's a variational formulation again. And what I will present now <coughs> is work together with uh, Andreas Bittracher. Um, he's the one behind many of these things and he's the, the big expert in it. And he, at the end, I will tell you that he already has now an algorithm which is working, a neural net algorithm, and doing this and identifying reaction coordinates based on a theory that I'm going to explain now. And they are the main. Yeah, sure. so there's a question. So, do you want to ask your question directly, or Daniel? I can try. Um, good evening. How, how's everybody doing? Um, I just want to ask. Uh, uh, this may be an ignorant question, but uh, just for my own edification, the, the reaction coordinates and the transient manifolds, the description for that is uh, not unique. Is that correct? Um, there, yes. there are many ways in which you can describe it. So my question is just in terms of uh, the, the ones that you showed. Um, in some way, one can regularize either for a very efficient description of the coordinates so that it's maybe a bit more entangled, but it's efficient in terms of the dimensionality, or it's more interpretable. So my question is just the ones that you showed, uh, did you do any anything special to, to have it nicely interpretable? So it's, it's, well, it was very nicely untangled. Did you have to do a, additional yeah. work for regularization to, to achieve that? Or is it just a consequence of the physics? Again, um, we do not have a real result on this, but, but we believe, or I believe, that something like the transition manifold is unique, but the reaction coordinates obviously is just a parameterization of the transition manifold. So it's not unique, and you are right. If you get, if you start these numerical algorithms and get these point clouds, <clears throat> then they only look nice if you use the right um, <clears throat> manifold embedding techniques. So what you uh, you, you you use uh, manifold learning techniques in order to get the points that you have on which you have computed your reaction coordinate in order to find the right coordinates on this manifold, so the right parameterization of the manifold. So at the end, it is manifold learning techniques, which give us these nice pictures. Is this an answer? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask, have curiosity, uh, uh, in terms of, is, is there something special in terms of the regularization for the, the let's call it, uh, like it, what one almost has with independent component analysis, where you really try to have independent coordinates, where each yeah. coordinate is something specifically, or is, it, is that the kind of regularization I assume that's being used? to try and find these nice descriptions. Yeah, there are, there are approaches which are using this independent component or independent variable idea. And um, this is not done here. We just use, let's say, diffusion map techniques, for example, or other manifold learning techniques in order to find parameterizations of it. And up to now, we haven't uh, looked into really um, showing whether these coordinates are also independent in some dynamical sense. Yeah. At the moment, I'm just interested in finding a low dimensional structure on which I can co project my transfer operator so that the dynamical information which I can extract from this object mm -hmm. is correct in the sense that it reproduces the right time scales. That, for example, at the end for this, for this receptor process, for the ligand entering the receptor, I can compute the right K on and K, K off, so the, the on transition and the off transition probabilities are the time scales. This is what I'm interested in. But I agree. It would be also very interested to, uh, interesting to see whether this can be decomposed into, in some sense, independent components. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Could you superimpose on this picture here of the point cloud, could you superimpose trajectories to show how you get to that upper left fold folding of 80% more or less. Is this there is, a way to uh, is there a way to do that? You, you still have to understand that the typical trajectory, I cannot show it in this space, but what a typical trajectory does, it goes into 
it is in one of the deep wells, yeah, but it first goes into one of the minor important wells and is there for a long period of time because it finds an act before it finds an exit and then goes down into the well. And then it stays there for very, very long periods of time before it finds the, can cross the energy barrier <coughs> by that crossing other minima in order to go to, into the other well. So trajectory representation contain lots of in, in, unimportant information because these trajectories are just wiggling around. What we are interested in is the progress along a reaction pathway. So how is the system slowly moving along the pathway characterized by the reaction coordinates? That's not real dynamics. It's just a progress in a kind of transition, uh, in, in a kind of transition probability. The real dynamics is telling us nothing. You will see that the system wiggles around and then somehow makes sudden changes into conf configuration or in conformations and then ends up in a folded state after some time. We have lots of videos for this but they don't tell you about the mechanisms. And what we try to find are low dimensional representations of the mechanisms of main progress along this reaction coordinates. Is this understandable? Yes, it helps a lot. I still am confused about the family of trajectories that you are averaging over to get the equilibrium and you have fast and slow equilibria and i'm asking actually for a basic definition of what you define equilibrium again an equilibrium in some sense is, is given by the invariant measure of the system so on an infinitely long time scale the system will visit all parts of its state space according to this equilibrium distribution. But this word equilibrium is meant in the sense it's, a it's an invariant measure. It's not an equilibrium in, in a mathematical sense. So the system as a whole <coughs> has a, a guaranteed property that it samples the Boltzmann distribution in infinite time. What does it do on shorter times? On shorter times, if it starts in a well, it will stay within this well and will sample the, the restriction of the invariant distribution to this well. And then on longer times, there's a probability that it crosses the energy barrier and visits another well and stays there also so long that it more or less samples the local distribution there. Only on infinite time, it samples everything according to the equilibrium distribution. So these, the local wells have a kind of quasi equilibrium thing, quasi equilibrium or local equilibrium. And then the main time scales are given by the time scales needed to cross the main barriers in the energy landscape. But the energy landscape is so high dimensional that finding these wells is extremely difficult and computing the time needed to cross the barriers is, extreme, is extremely difficult. Therefore, we, find, we try to find a mathematical concept of reaction coordinates, which would tell you how the, the progress along these reaction coordinates would tell you how the system moves across the barriers and finds from one well into the next well. And the, if it is restricted to the reaction coordinate space, it has to sample the same statistical distribution than the full system, and it also has to have the same time scales that the full system has between if it switches between wells. But all the shorter time scales, this wiggling around in one well is gone. Yeah. If I may, Christoph, if, if you learn an effective potential in the low five coordinates, you could plot a trajectory of that. Sure. This is the next step. This would be yeah. give me, a, a, let's say, we do it equation free or whatever, give me an effective dynamics in terms of the reaction coordinates. Yeah. But first I have to find good reaction coordinates oh, in, half, in order to have something which is low dimensional. And, and, and I want to ask something, I, it's fun to play the devil's advocate. You, you said before, it would be interesting to have independent coordinates even within the, the reaction coordinates, but I, why? 
I mean, it would be interesting, but it, once you have found the ones that you want, would it matter to do more processing within yeah. these? Yeah, there, is, there, are, there are some uh, systems, for example, proteins, where you know that, uh, for example, they, in order to get to the folded structures, two substructures have to fold first. But it's okay. not clear which one of this folds first. Then an orthogonal, an independent, these would be two independent parts of the reaction coordinate, and together they form the full one. This would be interesting to understand. Yeah, okay, it, it, yeah, I, it would be cleaner. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. But now I want to come to this to this new form, which is much easier to understand. And if you allow me, then let me introduce this concept of lumpability, because that's we are in this context in which we have this invariant density. So the system on an infinite time scale is a godic, it samples this landscape pi, this invariant distribution, and we have reversibility. And the system gives us our transition probability. For example, over the Langevin or something else doesn't matter. Then we say that the system is absolutely lampable if there is a reaction coordinate, so a, a low dimensional thing. Yeah. This, the Xi maps to a low dimensional space. And then these two transition probabilities are almost the same. <laughs> and what you see is where you start on the ISO uh, surface of Xi, the Xi doesn't matter. More or less where you start gives, me, gives you always the same, almost the same transition probabilities if time is long enough. So you have to choose an immediate time, ignore all the fast ones, and then on a longer time, you will see that all the transition probabilities which start on the same ISO surface are almost the same. And if the system has such a reaction coordinate, then we call it lumpable or epsilon lumpable. And this is, is known by something, by, by lots of um, discrete processes for Markov chains and things. There, the idea of lumpable is that you can lump together discrete states in a continuous setting, as it is this. And then we can find that slow fast systems, so the typical case where one part of the system is fast and the other is slow, you can show that it is epsilon lumpable uh, because the more or less the slow coordinate is the right reaction coordinate. Or if you have, um, again, my, my Fokker Planck equation, where you have a spectral gap after the kth eigenvalue. Then you can take uh, psi by the by the first eigenvalues and will be able to show that it is epsilon lumpable. Uh, but this psi does not necessarily have to have the dimension of the eigenvalues; you just have to parameterize them. This is later important. So the, the typical systems have this property, but for us it is important that if the system that we described before, this strange transition manifold. If something like this exists, then we can immediately show that such a transition function exists and the system is epsilon lumpable. Does that, this means that the systems which have transition manifolds, and therefore, because they have transition manifolds, projection to the reaction coordinate gives you a very good approximation of the longest time scales. These systems are also epsilon lumpable. And the, and the, uh, the reaction coordinates with respect to which they are epsilon lumpable, these are exactly the, the, the ones that are characterized by the transition manifolds, which me measure the progress along the transition manifold. And again, this tells you immediately that the, the Xi with respect to which a system is epsilon lumpable is obviously something which also will be uh, non unique because the parameterization can change in general. So what would we do normally if we want to use this idea? We would go and say, in a neural net context, uh, we would write down a loss function. And opposite to the trans uh, transition manifold formulation, what is written here gives you immediately a loss function. You would look for the Xi, which minimizes this strange functional. The only disadvantage is that you don't know the PL. And you would have to compute this in addition, which obviously seems to be something which you should, which is not wise to do, because you're just interested in the reaction coordinate and not in all these transition probabilities. So this goes into the right direction. 
And then the main idea uh, of Andreas was that we can do uh, a variational or rational loss function. <laughs> we can uh, write it down in a, in a slightly different form and using the idea that two transition probabilities which start from the same contour line, here the contour line, the Z is the same, or the same isosurface, they should be similar to each other. So this should be, this error should be very small. And then you can surprisingly show that the minimum of this new functional in which the PL does not appear is up to epsilon the same than the minimum of the functional that co comes from lumpability, which at the end means we have reformulated our system in a way where the, the lumpability transition probability does not, no longer appear. This can be immediately done. And how are you going to do it? You can write it down in, again, a little bit different form, which is just using reversibility as of from here, from this form to this form is just using reversibility, just mathematical reformulation. And then you can say, okay, but this can be done by Monte Carlo approximation. So what I do here is just computing uh, trajectories. And these trajectories start from initial points, which have to be distributed according to the invert measure. But then you just have to <coughs> estimate these, the burst of simulations from certain points and giving all the endpoints allows you to compute this, these integrals. And this in effect, in effect means that by Monte Carlo approximation, you can compute the functional that you want to optimize, value of the functional for a given reaction coordinate. And <coughs> at the end, what, what can be shown and which is surprising is that this Monte Carlo approximation depends on something, on a function which is only living on the low dimensional space. So it's not something depending on the dimension of the full system, it's only depend, depending on the dimension of direction coordinate. So there really is hope because the system is more or less reformulated on a much smaller dimension. And the Monte Carlo error only depends on this function living on a low dimension and on the number of trajectories that you allow for. And then we can even characterize this variation there is no theorem for it, but all numerical experiments show that this is, is a nicely, it's a small, small uh, term. So you have the typical convergence of Monte Carlo with uh, the number of trajectory square root, which is very nice. So this now means that you are in a setting in which you can <coughs> use this function, you can compute this function in a dimension of direction coordinate and then can use deep learning algorithms in order to parameterize the transition probabilities via the deep learning ansatz functions. You, you parameterize your reaction coordinates, compute this thing via Monte Carlo, and then to do the typical stuff which you do for deep learning, you do uh, the parameterization by uh, stochastic gradient descent and get the best parameters and therefore the best reaction coordinates. So, and, and the main statement is that the direction coordinates you, you compute by this, if there is a transition manifold, will automatically lead to something which has this guarantee on the, on the time scales, which is a very, very nice property. Uh, and then the next step, obviously, are uh, use this as a loss functional, as a quality measure for. Um, that's the second point. So solve this optimization problem. So the minimization of the L tilde via neural networks, this is already working and obviously is tonight uh, the right direction to go into. Another aspect is <clears throat> that now you have the means to test reaction coordinates which are given to you by physicists or chemis chemistry people because you, now you can compute more or less an, an error common. You can compare them because in terms of this functional, in terms of the last function, the best ones have the smallest error. 
And this is uh, enormously important because in the literature for many complicated processes, people discuss several <coughs> uh, proposals for possible reaction coordinates. And now we have the means to mathematically compare them, which also is nice. But the second point is the one that I'm, I'm mainly interested in for the future because I believe that it allows us to find reaction coordinates. The neural network structure helps us to, um, to tackle the high dimension of the integrals, which you saw there. But the Monte Carlo procedure allows us, because it only depends on the dimension of reaction coordinate, to compute the values in every step quickly enough. So that's the main idea. So this is what was more or less what I wanted to, to tell to you. Um, you see that there are many, peoples who, uh, uh, many people who contributed to this kind of, of theory, mainly Andreas Petraha, but also Peter Koda, Stefan Kuss, Markus Weber. Some uh, colleagues internationally, this is just a short list and not complete. And uh, you see that there are two, um, two main uh, funding schemes, one of the German collaborative research centers and the Excellence Cluster MF Plus. And let me go back to the last slide before I end. Uh, I hope that within uh, a few weeks or months, we will have the paper out about the neural networks. And there you will see that this is really a, a way where the, the, the huge potential of deep learning algorithms can be used in order to compute reaction codes. So that's it, more or less. Thanks for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? comments or yeah so the reaction coordinates should indicate some direction of the chemical molecular reaction are they associated with the with the so-called real world of the folding or what we are talking about here Yes, so let me go to the picture back. So what they tell you is, in this case, for example, um, it, it, it tells you if you start from the unfolded struct, how you make progress along this manifold until you end up in the folded structure. And as Janis told us, if we have this low dimensional structure, we can use all the dynamic information we have computed in order to get uh, an effective dynamics for this. <clears throat> not only to understand the, um, the uh, transition time scales or the folding time scales, but also to get um, a kind of dynamical representation of the progress. And in this cases, uh, what you get, you can easily see that along the transition manifolds, you have the step by step the, the, the progress from the from the first attachment of a peptide to the stack of peptides. And then the, the different steps it is using until it's more or less part of the stack. And that's very important for, for example, for biophysics because it helps them to understand how this mechanism is happening step by step. And by using something like transition path theory, we could also uh, compute the, uh, the different uh, timescales of each single step. So at the end, we really get a characterization of this process with timescales. And that's exactly what I wanted to have in the beginning. Okay, so again, if I look at these two major pictures, <clears throat> not, not necessarily here, but maybe here too on the left, on the upper left, the red path, is there some attractor here? in terms of dynamical systems, but again, again related to the chemistry. A, a, an attractor of such a system would mean that it ends up on a lower dimensional uh, structure and stays there infinitely. Yes, so that's what that's I call the global- That's not the case. It's not the case. Oh, okay. This is only the case in the function space. As I said, the Fokker-Planck equation, because the system has an invariant distribution, the Fokker-Planck equation has this structure. Wherever you start, you end up in the, in the invariant distribution. 
So there is in the function space, there is a delta point, the invariant distribution, where you go, will go to. But that the system itself doesn't have a, a, an attractor because every point of the system is on infinite time scale visited with the probability given by the Boltzmann distribution. This probability is very, very small where the energy, uh, energy level is high and much higher where the energy is very low, but it's non-zero for all points. So there is no attractor. A transition manifold is just a low dimensional structure uh, along which the progress of the main transitions in the system goes. And this is low dimensional and everything else is just fluctuating around this low dimensional structure. But this low dimensional structure is a manifold in function space. It's not some linear, linear subspace of something. So these systems are different than the ones that we normally know from dynamical systems, where we have some kind of attractive structure that we more or less approach exponentially or however, and then in infinity, we, we get a distribution on this. This is different here. The transition manifold is not something on which the system is happening after very, very long time. That's wrong. So that's why it's very important that you emphasize the role of time scales here. Yes. It's all about time scales. Right. Okay, I got now the the distinction and I have two other questions that are not directly related to your talk, if you can tolerate me. Sure. You started with Fokker-Planck formulation, yep. but there is something called, sorry for the long name, Shmulekovsky equation or formulation. And I wonder how different this would be. And the second question is even farther from your talk. You mentioned deep learning, but there are some now studies of molecular dynamics calculations via quantum computing that are related to this general problem of folding. So I don't know if there is any comment about this too. <clears throat> So first, the first question, the, the, the Fokker-Planck equation um, is um, the, in, in mathematics, it's just a name for the forward or backward Kolmogorov equation, depending on how you look at the system. And physics call it the Fokker-Planck equation. Then there are some communities which call a very similar equation, which moves probability distributions to Smolokovsky equation. But there's another gang of people in physics which call this equation here on top the Smolokovsky equation. So this term is not clear. And every community has a different understanding of it. I avoid it. For me, the term Fokker-Planck equation is the right name for the equation which governs the, the, the evolution of probability distributions. Or you can also call it the Kolmogorov, the forward or backward Kolmogorov equation. Uh, what kind of Smolokovsky equation you may mean, I cannot say, but it is, there are so many different meanings of it that I try to avoid the name. The th second thing is um, quantum computing. In some sense, the switch from the dynamics of the system to a Fokker-Planck equation or a transfer operator is very similar to typical quantum descriptions where you use um, um, <clears throat> and, and a, a, a wave packet formulation of the system because it describes an ensemble of trajectories and not a single trajectory. So all the things that we do with transfer operators um, can be rephrased phrased in some sense in, the, in quantum computing terms. But how this could be done for a real system on a real quantum computer I guess nobody knows at the moment. It smells like this. 
up to now, I haven't seen anything that I find um, trustable. <clears throat> so there are some theoretical works which are very promising, but I haven't seen a real algorithm for this. If there is something and you know about it, please tell me. I'm very interested. Yeah, I, I'll give you the name of uh, Asparo Guzik in Toronto. G-U-Z-I-K. And he will be happy to learn about your work and vice versa, I believe yeah. so. Okay. Um, so I, ho I hope the name is clear. Asparo, and he has another third name that I forget. but. Uh, I admire him and I have now to put you also in that list. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, any other questions, comments? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christoph, for a very interesting talk. Yeah, very clear. Uh, my question is related to your. Uh, beginning uh, of your talk, uh, the example. So example, uh, which is based on molecular dynamic simulations. Yeah. So as you know quite well, molecular dynamic simulations assume that you start with Hamiltonian description, yeah? No, sorry, no, uh, that's wrong. Mean? No, no, for, for all simulations, which uh, uh, we are doing for transport problem, what we are doing, we can see the Hamiltonian, which we simulate as Hamiltonian. So at least the problem you described. Yeah, uh, but if you if you simulate a Hamiltonian system, then you get constant energy. Uh, yes, but the and this uh, means you only sample okay. the energy surface given by the emission energy. Oh, okay, in in this case, it's just the comment that the problem you start with is written on the Hamiltonian language and this okay. decision to overdump uh, or not overdump Langevin dynamics is a big uh, question. A at least it's follow from uh, what I'm doing uh, for studying transport problems. Yeah, but, 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 please... but I un understand your answer. So your idea is uh, let's assume that I can use uh, this language of stochastic equation to describe the transport. Is it correct? No. What I say is that um, molecular dynamics, if it is normally understand for, understood for systems with temperature, biological systems, it belongs to the, um, the ensemble given by the Boltzmann distribution. And molecular dynamics trajectories perhaps use things that look like a Hamiltonian, Berlin algorithm, but then they, they do uh, thermostatic in order to get a distribution in order to guarantee that they converge to this distribution, no longer one energy cell, this distribution. And, and this is just the mathematically easiest mathematical um, system that I can write down, which samples this distribution as an invariant measure. I could write down different things. For example, the full Langevin dynamics with friction or uh, other Hamiltonian-like embeddings, but with transition probabilities between hybrid Monte Carlos, is, is it called? Or thermostatic system, whatever. They all have main properties. Most of them have reversible dynamics and they have this invariant distribution and they are ergodic or supposed to be ergodic with respect to this distribution. And these are the two properties that I needed today. I just need, there is a transition probability. It is a transition probability rel relative to this invariant distribution, the one that I'm interested in. And the system has some kind of reversibility. And then I'm happy and can do my job. It's not depending on this form of the dynamics, but it is not available for pure Hamiltonian systems because for pure Hamiltonian systems, the transfer operator has a spectrum which is dense on the unit circle in a complex plane. And I can do nothing without regularizing it. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for comment. I understand uh, your point, but uh, I, I would say the first example is slightly misleading in this respect. And I would not agree that what we are doing in molecular dynamic simulation described by the equation you it's written because 
the way how thermostat is it has been done in many other tricks. But but it's it's matter of uh, discussion outside of this talk. But it, it's clear and I understand your topic, uh, your point. Um, thank you for that. It's it's very important. Uh, yeah. The second question is also related to uh, your first example uh, for transport problem, for biological transport problem. What we have we have non equilibrium situation. So typically we have a gradient. Uh, um, of density of, of solution or whatever. So my question is, okay, you heavily use equilibrium dynamics for this development. Uh, what will be your comment? What would happen if the situation is non-equilibrium? So again, I am interested in systems which are described by this equilibrium. You are completely correct. Receptors in a cell surface are in this kind of equilibrium. That's more or less believed. I agree that it is interesting to understand how non-equilibrium situations in the sense of the system is open to exchange forces or whatever with, with the external. <clears> that this is very, very interesting. Especially it is interesting for molecules which are in addition in the influence of an external electric field, for example, our mobile phones. And there are descriptions for this. They are different from what I explained today. I agree completely. And yeah. that's, that's so, a so, new direction. So it, yeah, effectively, uh, at the moment, you don't have the link how to connect uh, these developments with non-equilibrium case. This is your Again, answer. there are some articles which connect. No, exactly no, I, this. I, I, I know. I, I just look yeah. for your opinion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you. I think that's the future direction because it is more and more important that we want to influence the systems externally in order to change the transition behavior. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, yeah, understood, yeah. thanks. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, thanks again, Christophe, for the talk. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thanks a lot. Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to end uh, the session now. Thanks again, take care everyone. Very good. Thanks. Thanks for that. Have a good evening. Yeah, thank you too. Thank you.